Hey, peeps, welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. Today, I'm joined once again by Dr. Scott Berman, philosophy professor at St. Louis University, as well as a new guest and beloved patron of the channel, Gunther Laird. So our topic is Platonism, and in particular, philosopher Ed Fazer's critical engagement thereof. I brought on Scott as the resident Platonist, of course, uh, and I recommend people check out our earlier video on Scott's book, Platonism and the Objects of Science. Both his book and that discussion are linked in the description, so you guys can check that out. But Gunther is a new guest on the channel. Uh, in addition to graciously supporting me on Patreon, much love to all my patron supporters, uh, Gunther is a philosophy enthusiast who published a book, The Unnecessary Science, a critical analysis of natural law theory, in which he examines and criticizes the ethics, metaphysics, and philosophy of religion of philosopher Ed Fazer. Now, uh, we'll be focusing today on what Gunther writes about Fazer's take on Platonism and Aristotelianism and divine conceptualism. So for those interested, you can check out my playlist, Abstract Objects and Theism, uh, and in particular, my video entitled, Do Abstract Objects Prove God? For more on divine conceptualism and, and Fazer's Augustinian proof and Platonism and so on. Now, I have to be honest from the outset before we get into our discussion that um, I haven't read the full book yet from Gunther, except for the relevant portion on today's topic, The Metaphysics of Universals. Of course, I have my research projects of my own as as well as being a full-time student. So uh, that requires boatloads of reading. And I just say this because some people online aren't very charitable and they tend to assume that just because I have someone on my channel, that means I automatically like agree with everything they write or I automatically uh, endorse everything they write, uh, everything they publish. So for the audience, for those uncharitable trolls, that, that's what I'm saying this for. <laughs> but um, nevertheless, I'm here to make you guys, the audience, aware of Gunther's work so that y'all can check it out. And so I've linked uh, his book in the description. So check that out as well. Uh, so Gunther, can you just briefly tell us the main thesis of your book, The Unnecessary Science, and, and why you wrote it? Of course, The Unnecessary Science primarily critiques Catholic and natural law, ethics, and metaphysics as portrayed in the writing of Edward Fazer. Its main argument is that the metaphysical theories Fazer holds cannot, uh, cannot support the ethical and theological conclusions he draws from them. And uh, I wrote the book simply because I had seen so many Catholics, both on and offline, hold up Fazer as a slam dunk defense of Catholicism and destroyer of not just atheism, but modernity, so to speak, as well. So I figured a handy reference guide, so to speak, of the problems with Fazer's philosophical approach would be very handy to anyone who's run into one of his disciples, of which there are quite a few indeed. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um... That's just a brief stuff for the audience for his book. And now here's just the structure of the video. Everyone knows that I love my outlines, my structure. So uh, first we're just gonna be briefly defining some of the key terms that we've been using, throwing around like Aristotelianism, Platonism and so on. Uh, second, we'll look at some of Fazer's particular arguments against Platonism and uh, correlatively for his uh, preferred divine conceptualism. Third, we're gonna be looking at particularly comparing the theories of Platonism and divine conceptualism. And if we have time, we'll look at some of Gunther's own like proposals about the problem of universals and we'll kind of interact with that. Uh, and then finally, of course, we'll conclude. So now let's go on to that first section, which is definitions. Okay, so um, we need to understand those key terms that I was laying out. And because Scott and I covered them in quite a lot of depth in our previous discussion, we'll be pretty brief here for the audience. So if you want more in depth, go to that discussion that we had. Uh, and again, it's linked in the description. Scott, could you just uh, define for us nominalism, Platonism, contemporary Aristotelianism and classical Aristotelianism? Sure. So briefly, the nominalist thinks that a necessary condition for existence is being located somewhere in space-time uh, and that there are no universals. The, con the contemporary Aristotelian agrees that uh, a necessary condition for existence is being located in space-time somewhere, but would add uh, the existence of universals to that uh, ontology. Uh, the classical Aristotelian and the Platonists disagree with that assumption. They both think that there can exist things that aren't located in space-time. And the uh, Aristotelian thinks that, that these non-spatio-temporal things exist, but in a lesser sense of existence. So it's the equivocity of being thesis that the classical Aristotelian uses to mitigate the ontological uh, commitment uh, to universals. So they exist, but they exist in a lesser sense. And then the Platonist thinks that you know, if you want all the benefits, you have to pay the full price, and that universals exist non-spatio-temporally, and in the same sense that you and I exist in uh, full-blooded existence, just not located anywhere in space-time. All right, and uh, 
I guess another another vlog just for the audience, um, just this kind of different ways of being or modes of existence or lesser existence. You guys can check out my video with uh, Dr. Trent Merricks. Uh, we talked about um, ontological pluralism and ontological monism, and we went, we went through one of uh, one of Dr. Merricks's arguments for uh, ontological monism, which would indeed support uh, support Scott's view and the kind of Platonist view as he was just outlining it. So, um, yeah, just, just a quick shout out for that because that was a really fun conversation, and you know. Dr. Trent Merricks, it's like a big deal. So Gunther, let's go on to you and let's ask how Fazer himself understands these terms. Uh, and in particular, how does he define and relate uh, the Platonism, Aristotelianism, and thirdly, divine conceptualism? I'm deriving these definitions from Fazer's uh, recent, comparatively recent book, Five Proofs of the Existence of God. Uh, there, he defines Platonism, uh, first off, as the thesis that universals or abstract objects exist in a sort of third realm, and the material things we experience around us are would be uh, just mere reflections or instantiations of forms in that third realm. Uh, for Aristotelian realism, uh, he described this as the position that universals do ex universals, excuse me, do exist, but not in a third realm of sorts. Rather, they exist in the material things themselves, which human minds abstract into forms. And finally, uh, his preferred divine conceptualism is the thesis that uh, universals or abstract objects or forms or propositions or mathematical truths and so on exist not in a third realm, but not in just particular things. They rather exist as divine ideas in an infinite, necessary, and eternal mind, which would namely be God's mind. I'll turn it over to Scott briefly just to comment on whether or not you uh, maybe agree with some of those characterizations or if you have any comments on those, Scott. Um, I mean, I know for me, I like, I don't quite know what like a reflection is, like the ordinary things around us are somehow reflections of forms as if they somehow like resemble the forms. Um, oftentimes they don't really resemble them in any way. You just have a kind of non-spatiotemporal abstract property that that we exemplify or instantiate. There isn't a kind of resemblance or reflection there. Uh, that was one of my thoughts on Facer's definition of Platonism, but do you have any other comments, Scott? Sure, uh, yeah, I mean, I, the, the way that this guy, Fezer, Fezer uh, outlines the difference, different views, he seems to think that the, the issue under discussion is, a, is about where these universals are. Mm -hmm. Are they in space-time? Are they in some third realm? Are they in God's mind? And I, I think that's just a caricature of at least the difference between Plato and Aristotle, neither one of which thought that the universals were literally located anywhere. They're non-spatial. So to say that they're in God's mind begs the question, okay, well, where's God? I mean, po point where that is so I can see where that is. I mean, just that I don't understand, honestly, what that view is. And yes, it's captured beautifully, this caricature in uh, in uh, Raphael's painting <laughs> in the Vatican, which is beautiful. It's definitely worth seeing, but it's just a beautiful representation of that caricature, um, not really of their philosophical views. As far as the, your worry, Joe, about reflections, yeah, that's certainly not what Plato thought, uh, though he uses that language a little bit. But I mean, just as an easy example, parabolinus, y equals x squared, doesn't look anything like a parabola in space-time. I mean, like y equals x squared looks nothing like that shape. It's just, it's, it explains the nature of the kind of thing that it is. Redness isn't literally a red thing. Uh, I know that's part of this caricature of Plato that I don't want to really discuss, but yeah. uh, in order for something to be red, it's got to reflect the longest wavelength of visible light and things that exist outside of space time can't reflect any wavelengths of visible light, let alone the longest one. So redness is not itself a red thing. And Plato did not think that. That would be, I think, kind of a foolish view to have. Uh, and he was no fool. But so I don't know. I, I hope we're not going to just be talking cross like mid ships uh, passing in the night here if we're laying out the definitions so differently from yeah. each other. I, I don't think we will. I think we can kind of analyze because a lot of what he says, a lot of what Fazer says in terms of like criticizing his Platonism as he characterizes it would also apply to the way that you characterize it. So he gives that. Kind oh, of good. That, oh, we have no causal contact. He gives that kind of objection and so on that, that we have in our discussion, but we'll also cover here. I think that's a nice bridge into our next section, which is Fazer's arguments against Platonism and uh, correlatively for divine conceptualism. Um, so Gunther, can you, uh, analyze, can you outline each of these arguments and let's just proceed to them one by one and we'll kind of analyze them together. So uh, let, yeah, let's just go through them one by one. You'll give one and then, and then we'll 
we'll pause and kind of reflect on. Uh, this is again taken primarily from Dr. Fazer's Five Proofs of the Existence of God. Uh, his first objection to Platonism is that uh, Platonic forms and other denizens of the so-called third realm seem to be causally inert. He states there's no clear way of uh, kind of laying out the relationship between something in a third realm and something in uh, the mundane realm of our experience, so to speak. Although, again, this is a paraphrase, not his exact, not his exact uh, phrasing. And that's uh, the first objection. Okay, so yeah, it's that causal contact one. And I mean, I, we could probably put this in premise by premise form, you know, it's like premise one, we don't have any causal contact with these abstract objects. Premise two, if we don't have causal contact with these abstract objects, then there's no way we could come to knowledge of them. And so there's no way we could come to knowledge of these abstract objects, given, given what Platonism says about their intrinsic nature or character. Uh, but uh, you know, that, then that kind of removes any reason that we would have for being Platonists. Like, of course, we want to say that we have knowledge of them because um, we, we want them to do explanatory work and things like that. So um, I know Scott and I kind of uh, railed against this in our discussion, but uh, a lot of the audience members haven't seen that discussion yet. So um, Scott, what, what are some of your preliminary thoughts on this? It's a very popular objection too. So like- I, I understand that. I mean, the thing is, is that, yes, the forms, the uh, platonic universals are causally inert. Uh, the, the law of uh, gravity does not cause an apple to fall from the tree. It explains why the apple falls in the way that it does, but it doesn't cause the apple to fall from the tree. So the fact that these non-spatio-temporal universals, these things are causally inert is part of the theory. Yes, absolutely. Their explanatory entity is not causal. Uh, the worry is, is this causal theory of knowledge that you can only have knowledge of things that you have causal interactions with. I mean, if knowledge is restricted by perception, then I would say, sure. But if human beings can reason, and we can reason not just uh, deductively, but abductively and inductively, then we can go beyond our perceptions. We can reason and come to know things that we don't see. That's what science is. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, yeah, I mean, they're not causal, true, but that doesn't restrict them from being objects of knowledge because we can reason yeah. and go beyond our perceptions, which are causally interacting with us. So I guess I'm unclear as to the force of the objection. Yeah, first, I, th I think that we should just reject that second premise that knowing something requires causal contact with it. I mean, one thing that um, I brought up in our discussion, in my discussion with Scott is like, did they did they come into causal contact with that claim itself? I, like, surely not. Like, no. Um, instead, they reason to that claim on the basis of a variety of like oh, explanatory considerations. Like, they look around us, see different facts of knowledge, see different uh, things impinging on, a, on our sensory faculties in certain ways, and then they infer on the basis of that the best explanation of how we come to knowledge. None of these principles of best explanation of abduction and so on are such that they like causally impinge on them in some way. Instead, they can just see them. They use their reason. And uh, they use the standard theoretical virtues to come to believe in them. So it's not as though the truth of that second premise is like, you know, causing them, like knocking them on the head or anything like that. So by its own lights, they wouldn't be able to know that second premise. And so there's a kind of self-undermining worry, firstly. But secondly, yeah, the project of science, the project of metaphysics, what we use is these uh, explanatory theoretical virtues of explanatory breadth and depth and simplicity and unification and so on, predictive fruitfulness. We use these to go beyond what we can have causal contact with to try to see what explains those things, even if we don't have causal contact with the further explanations. So we just have to compare the theories and use these standard theoretical virtues. That can help give us knowledge, even though we don't have causal contact with the things in question. So yeah, I don't find this plausible, this, this objection plausible at all. But uh, what do you think, Gunther? I see your and Dr. Berman's point. Uh, when I had written my book, uh, The Unnecessary Science, uh, this was before I had read uh, Scott's book on Platonism concerning the objects of science. Now, I do think there's still the issue of a causal connection, uh, because even though, as you correctly point out, uh, abstractions themselves aren't knocking on our heads and forcing themselves into a causal relationship uh, with our beliefs, uh, they are related to the physical world in some way, mm -hmm. as, for instance, um, a proposition about, say, the redness of apples isn't uh, just sort of hanging out in some third realm. It's 
uh, directly connected to the physical states of affairs that says apples actually are red, that is to say ap apples actually reflect uh, wavelengths of lights in, uh, in such and such way. So I wouldn't entirely dismiss uh, the critique of causal irrelevancy when it comes to Platonism, but I do think there are ways to kind of bridge that gap. And I think uh, Scott does this very well in his book. That was the first argument. And, you know, we, we raised some criticisms, the self-defeating worry or the self-undermining worry, rather. And secondly, the kind of we could just use our reason and look at the theoretical virtues approach. Now let's move on to that, to the second argument that, uh, Gunther, you're going to lay out for us. OK, the second one, uh, Phaser raises, again, this is more of a direct quote. I, I'm not sure of the exact page number, but this is more or less what he says. Uh, Platonic realism seems to regard a form as something both universal, that is, instantiated in many things, and also existing as a particular individual thing in its own right. For instance, take the form of man. Uh, individual men are men only because they, uh, quote unquote, participate in this form, says the platonic realist. But if the form of man itself is an individual object, doesn't that entail there must be some other form of man that it participates in and by reference to which it counts as a form of man? Uh, this is uh, what's called the third man argument, I believe, as Phaser uh, describes it. Uh, I'm not sure where to begin. So, uh, <laughs> I, you know, like the the law of gravity is one law, and yet it can apply to multiple patterns, physical patterns, and be true of. It can explain multiple things, even though it's just one thing that explains those multiple causal patterns uh, of why planets move in the way they do and why apples fall from trees and so forth. It doesn't make it a plurality because it can apply to more than one thing. Uh, the, the third man argument, uh, that's... Okay, that, that we need to be very careful with because it's one thing to say that there has to be another universal that explains why the universal human is a universal and another to say that it's human. And so I'm not sure which one he was bringing in, but if you're worried about a regress argument, I mean, here's, the, here's what I would say, that, that the, the universal human uh, is what we call properties, a, a property, a quality, a characteristic, a type. And its instantiation is not a thing with a property. It's a human, right? So the instantiation of the universal human is a particular human. It's not like a thing with a property. So it's not like there's the property human and then also the universal, right? The universal is the property and it's not in space time. This is just a human not a thing with properties. There's many universals that are true of this, human, five foot eightness, whiteness, clean shavenness, so forth. Uh, and it's all those different, it's an instantiation of all those different kinds of things. As you were spelling it out, um, Gunther, you were saying that Phaser says essentially that like Platonic realism would regard a form or a universal as something that's both universal, that is instantiated in many things, and also a particular uh, and then individual thing in its own right. And he says, that, oh, that seems incoherent. But like, that just seems to me to be confused, right? I mean, we have a universal, a property. Yeah, that is in some sense an individual thing, right? But many distinct particular things can exemplify it or stand in an instantiation relation to it. That, that doesn't require one thing to be both such that it's universal and particular. I, just, I find it, anyway, I find it just confused. Uh, the second thing is like the third man argument, right? I don't think we have that regress that is engendered by this because no one is saying that the property of being human, say, has like is a flesh and bones human, right? If, if it were, then yeah, we would have something shared in common between the property of being a human and all the other humans. And then we'd have to, you know, we'd have to have some other property that in virtue of which they all share something in common. But that's not the proposal. The proposal is that there's this non spatiotemporal abstract property of being human, and that shares very, very, very little in common with flesh and bones, particular humans. And so you don't have this vicious regress worry. If anything, the vicious regress worry arises as a result of the kind of caricature of, of Plato that we were talking about earlier, where, um, oh, you have the particular things that are just like mere images or, or resemblances of, of the forms. So th those are my thoughts on, on that particular argument. But um, if, if you three are fine with going on to the, to the next argument that Gunther, you want to lay out that, that Phaser gives. The final issue he raises, uh, again, this is a quote, it's entailed by the fact that uh, platonic realism implies the essences or natures of things of our experience are not in the things themselves, but exist in the platonic third realm. 
the essence or nature of a tree, for example, is not to be looked for in the tree itself, but rather the form of tree, the essence of a human being is not to be looked for in any human being, but rather the form of a human being, and so on. Now, if treeness is not to be found in a tree, nor humanness in a human being, then it is hard to see how what we call a tree really exists, or as a tree, or what we call a human being really exists as a human being. Indeed, the trees and human beings we see are, uh, by Plato, uh, said merely to imperfectly resemble something else, namely the forms. So what we call a tree seems at the end of the day to be no more genuinely tree-like than a statue or a mirror image of a tree is. And I believe this comes from page 99 of Five Proofs of the Existence of Plato. So yeah, again, this is the caricature view of, of Plato. Uh, I, I mean, in order for it to be true that human beingness is true of this, this thing has to be a human being. So this can't be almost a human being. It has to actually be a human being. Uh, you know, in the in the Republic, uh, in book seven, we're going to go this route here. I mean, you know, it gives the example of the three fingers. The, the ring finger is tall relative to my pinky, and it's short relative to my middle finger. It doesn't, it isn't like imperfectly tall. It really is tall relative to my pinky, and it really is short relative to my middle finger. It's genuinely the case, 100%. It's not partial, it's all there. It's just that, that the point of Plato is that perceptibles are bad objects of knowledge. They're not bad objects. They're fine spatio-temporal things. They're just bad objects of knowledge, which was what the whole point of these three books are, uh, end of book five through book seven. Why, why should philosophers be in charge of the state? Because they're the only ones who can have knowledge, because uh, the way that Plato thinks of it is that the philosopher is the realist, and the non-philosopher is the nominalist who denies the existence of abstract objects. So they can't have knowledge because the only objects they can have in their ontology as objects of knowledge are perceptibles. But the bad thing with perceptibles is that they can appear to be their opposite, they can be their opposite, and they can become their opposite. That makes them bad objects of knowledge. It doesn't make them bad examples, right? If you're, you know, the forms, they can't appear to be their opposite, they can't be their opposite, and they can't become their opposite, that makes them reliable, makes them good objects of knowledge. That's the whole point of these passages. So if you're looking for a good object of knowledge, then the forms are what you want because they can't change, they can't be their opposites, right? Uh, whereas if you're looking for, say, you know, like a good person to spend your life with, the forms are not what you're looking for. You're looking for a living, breathing, metabolizing human being, right? If you can't go dancing with a form, right, you expect to have a good life with someone if you can't go dancing? I mean, forget about it, right? So you can't, you can't raise a family with a form. You can't have a conversation. I mean, it's a very one-sided conversation, but <laughs> presumably you want to have a, a dialogue with the person you spend your life with. Then... The human being is is great, and the form falls short. The form falls short of being a good thing to marry, right? Perceptibles fall short in being good objects of knowledge, but per perceptibles, but forms, let me see here, I say that right? Forms fall short of being good things to marry, good things to eat, uh, good things to paint your house with, but uh, perceptibles fall short if you're looking for a good object of knowledge. So the point of these passages in the Republic are, who has knowledge? Who would be good to have in charge of the state? Someone who had to have knowledge of what the good is. And so they have to believe in abstract objects that don't change, like the nature of goodness, um, such that they could have knowledge of it. It just seems like this objection is attributing to Plato a view that, that many people throughout history have had about Plato, but Plato himself never had. And Aristotle wasn't confused about this either. He did not attribute this view to, to Plato. He was not confused about it. I just think that the objection misfires. I don't know. I yeah. I mean, I agree with that. And like, even if Plato held that view, we can still focus on, on a kind of more contemporary analytic, lowercase p Platonism, and it would be impotent with respect to that. So that's, yeah. that's another thing that we could we could keep in mind. So let's move on to uh, that third section, uh, comparing Platonism and divine conceptualism. I want to ask uh, how uh, Scott thinks the forms or objects of knowledge uh, relate to minds. I take it you disagree with Phaser that the only place they could exist is a mind, thus obviating the need for a divine mind to contain them and lend them objectivity. Correct. I, I that they don't need to. Have, there doesn't need to be a mind to have them in uh, for them to be objective. Uh, it just uh, it, there needs to be a mind for there to be any understanding of them. 
But for them to exist, minds are irrelevant. They're not mind dependent in any way. They're mind independent of all minds, God's, ours, anybody's. Is there any particular account that you have, Scott, of kind of how we come to have knowledge of them apart from, uh, you know, of course we reason about them and we can have like theoretical virtues of them, but, you know, some, some Platonists like uh, to postulate propositions. And I know you, I think, and you said in our other conversation that um, you don't follow them and you don't follow these particular people in that. And, you know, some people who have these propositions think that we stand in certain belief relations to them. And, you know, we might stand in other relations to them. So they might unpack certain relationships that we have to these uh, propositions in terms of, of relations and other sorts of things. Do you have an account uh, as to how we relate to, in terms of our intellects and how we grasp these sorts of th things like numbers and so on? Do you have an account of that other than, you know, just maybe abstraction from particulars and reasoning about them? Or, or is that your main account? Uh, well, it, it depends on what we're thinking of by abstraction from particulars. So that is not a, a way I would be happy to put it. So I think that that when we reason about our experiences, we come to have these other things in mind that are already there uh, or already exist, not there, they already exist. And we come to be aware of them uh, intellectually. And so it's a cognitive relation. Uh, I, I don't, I definitely don't want to have any mediary objects like propositions uh, or meanings uh, any intentional objects in between us and the abstract objects that I think are also extensional. Just as we can reason our way to have, say, Napoleon in mind, even though he doesn't exist at the same time slice as ourselves, uh, we can also reason to have abstract objects in mind. That makes sense. Uh, like it doesn't pose any special problems for your particular view over and above no. other kinds of cognitive contact. No. Okay. Same, same explanation for both. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So, um, Gunther, I know that uh, you are going to kind of take the wheels with respect to certain problems that afflict divine conceptualism that, that you talk about in your book. So can you kind of take us through at least the first one of those that you want to go through? These issues I raise in about uh, pages uh, 264 and onwards in my book, The Unnecessary Science, uh, the first critiques of divine conceptualism, particularly relating to Platonism, I uh, take from a blogger named Ruth McQueen. Uh, he mentioned he mentioned that divine conceptualism doesn't really solve the Platonism the problems of Platonism purports to. Uh, for instance, he asks, uh, "Do objects instantiate uh, the universals they do because God conceives of them as doing so?" Uh, in that case, uh, God can have no reason for ordering the universals as it as he or she or whatever does. It's obvious that if we take uh, we are to take God's conceptions as objective. They must be based on an independently existing reality, on independently existing universals. If not, then the distribution of universals to objects must be completely arbitrary, and God must have no reason for conceiving them as he does. I kind of go on from this objection to build my own uh, kind of brand new, so to speak, objection to uh, divine conceptualism. As Fazer has, has said in other blog entries, God's omnipotence is limited only to what's uh, logically possible. The power to create a uh, round square, for instance, isn't actually a power at all. Uh, so God's inability to create a round square, that is to say, create something whose forms contradict each other, isn't a violation of his omnipotence because doing something that's self-contradictory isn't a um, power of any sort. But as I mentioned, it's God who determines what's uh, logically possible or logically contradictory. As I ask in The Unnecessary Science, why is it the case that round squares or two plus two equal, equaling five or any of those uh, relevant forms are contradictory to each other? After all, God could create purple squares or squares whose sides equal exactly four inches. So what makes a round and square incompatible with each other while purple or equilateral are compatible with square things. And as I mentioned, uh, according to the divine conceptualist view, the answer would have to be the forms for roundness and squareness are held within God's eternal mind, and God conceives of them in such a way that they're incompatible with each other, but are compatible with the forms of colors or numbers or whatever in relation to size or um, other such things. 
But again, that just raises the question, why does God conceive of these abstract objects in the way he does? Or again, to put it as uh, bluntly as I can, God cannot do what is self-contradictory, but God determines what is self-contradictory. So we're still left with a burning question about why God conceives of the forms in the way he does under divine conceptualism. So that's interesting. One way, one way that I'm thinking the divine conceptualist might push back on that is to say that, um, listen, God has various concepts by his, his very nature, his various divine ideas. He has the idea of triangularity and squareness and circularity and so on. That in virtue of which these things are incompatible with one another is not some mental act of God's, but rather it's just the pre-given nature of these very concepts themselves. Like just as the Platonist would say that the very nature of, of squarehood precludes uh, the, the nature of, of circularity, presumably the divine conceptualist could say, no, it's not God who's like determining that these things are incompatible with one another. Rather, God has certain concepts and these concepts themselves have a particular nature, right? They are a particular way that they are. And given their natures, they're just not compatible. And we can just kind of intuitively see that, right? So I think that's one way that the divine conceptualist might push back. It's like, it's not as though God's performing some additional act by which he like conceives of them as incompatible. And it's in virtue of that, that they're incompatible. Rather, God just has his first order concepts of these things in question. And those have a particular nature, which are, which are such that, you know, they're, they're not able to be combined in a certain way. So I'm wondering what you think about that response. Thank you very much, Joe. I thought this response would come up. And uh, my view is that it's kind of um, the divine conceptualism, the divine conceptualist, excuse me, has to pay something of a heavy price to hold it because it at least implies that the forms uh, precede God and constrain his activities in a way that a very devoted proponent of divine omnipotence wouldn't really uh, be entirely comfortable with. I mean, if you're going to say that it's just the nature of, say, squareness and roundness that they uh, contradict each other and there's no need for any other uh, mental activity, then you know, we have to ask uh, from whence did squareness and roundness considered as universes come from? If you're saying that God can't do anything uh, to make them uh, not contradictory, then it implies that these forms have an existence of their own uh, sort of overlying properties uh, that precede God and constrain what he's able to do in regards to them. So I think it's not really that much of an effective solution to the problem I've raised. Yeah, I'll, okay, so I'll make one more comment and then I'll turn it over to, to Scott just to see if he has any um, comments on this thing. One thing that I'm thinking is like, maybe they could just be like, yeah, in some sense they constrain God, but it's not any other constraint than we would imply by just saying like God can't make square circles and other sorts of things. Like it, it's a kind of logical constraint. It's not as though they're kind of independent of God. I mean, they're still divine ideas after all. And as such, they depend on, on him as an intellect, but um, it's just given their very nature is they can't be combined in a certain way. And that's just a kind of logical constraint. It's not as though, you know, God's proverbial hands are tied in some way, but rather it's just the same kind of logical constraint on any other action that God might perform. You know, God can't make two and two equal five. He can't make it the case that there both is a cat on the mat and it is not the case that there's a cat on the mat and so on. So I don't really see this as something unduly imposing itself on God, as it were. And I don't think it commits to an independent existence of these things over God. It's rather just constraints based on the very natures of the things in question. So I know we could probably go back and forth eternally on this, but um, let's just turn over to Scott uh, and then we'll maybe go on to one more problem that we're going to consider and then we'll, we'll like close this out. Well, I'm, I'm much more of a novice than the two of you about these issues. So uh, it's my understanding uh, that the, the, I think, if I understand what Gunther, Gunther was saying, is that the, the issue depends upon what your theory is about omnipotence. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you think that omnipotence is uh, all powerful, then it looks like God can make contradictions true. And what uh, I think what Gunther said is that the move, you no, know, all powerful is anything that's logically possible, right? So things that are impossible are not really things that could be made or not logically impossible. And so all powerful is just all things that are logically possible can do anything that's logically possible. I mean, I think that's cheating. I mean, I think that you should just say God is most powerful if that's what you have in mind. So God has more powerful, more power than anybody else. That's still a lot of power, uh, but not, it's not all powerful. 
So people who are worried about be, God being all powerful would not be happy with your friendly suggestion, Joe. <laughs> it probably, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head with like, it depends on our analysis of omnipotence. I, I really, it'll go down to that really. That would definitely take us too far afield. So let's move on Gunther, to just one final problem for uh, divine conceptualism. And we'll just talk about that for maybe five more minutes and then we'll close this out. I think a big problem for Phaser is his account of change. Whereas uh, as I, as I raised the question in my book, um, if the forms themselves are unchanging, but uh, the various things in the material universe uh, are changing in that they uh, take on and uh, dismiss forms on a regular basis, you know, we have to ask uh, what exactly is changing. Phaser might say that the forms themselves never change. It's just a matter of uh, Cambridge changes that refer and only to the relations they have with the things that instantiate them. Like, for instance, if we speak of the form of circularity and say, you know, at time one, uh, there are five uh, things in the universe exemplifying uh, circularity. And at time two, there are 10 things in the universe exemplifying uh, circularity. Uh, circularity itself hasn't changed. It's just a Cambridge change in the uh, relations of the things in the universe to it. But something clearly is changing, namely the universe itself and the things undergoing uh, the change from five uh, circular things to 10 circular things. So my problem for uh, divine conceptualism was that if you posit a uh, totally unchanging God, then even if the forms in his mind aren't changing, the things that exemplify those forms clearly are changing. But then where, where do these um, changing things exist? If they exist in God's mind, you know, perhaps as elements of a story God uh, is thinking about, then something in God's mind is changing. But if you want to say, uh, no, that's impossible, God's mind can't change, nothing in God's mind can change, then uh, you're led to the question of where uh, the particular things of our experience are located. And it seems absurd to say uh, they can be located somewhere outside of God's mind. Now, you ask where they exist. Now, Phaser is certainly going to want to say that they don't exist inside God's mind. He's going to want to say that, you know, God's totally transcendent and totally other than, than the world. So what's the difficulty with saying that they're outside of God's mind and they just exist in the humdrum spatio-temporal world and they're changing in there? Like, wh where's the difficulty with that? I, I wasn't really following. Well, God's mind is supposed to be infinite, right? Uh, Phaser and other Thomists use this language uh, in their work as well. So if God is infinite, uh, how could anything exist uh, outside of him? He's being himself. He's like being himself. I mean, that's that's kind of the classical theist definition of God as, you know, the absolute being itself, pure actuality and all that. So by saying the world of our experience is, you know, outside of God's mind, uh, somehow separate from it, I think that's kind of more of a separation between the underlying ground of all being that's supposed to be omnipresent, infinite, encompassing everything that could or does exist than um, someone holding to the classical theist view ought to really be comfortable with. I guess just um, just a final note, and, and Gunther, I think I think you and I could probably just email back and forth on this one because uh, I think it's really interesting, and I think it would take us too far afield. But just a final note, I just think that the classical theist will say that God's infinite, not in the sense of spans everything and encompasses everything, and such that everything is kind of located in Him, as it were, but rather He's infinite in the sense of He's not limited. He doesn't have any like finite boundaries that constrain his, his being in some way. And so then he has like infinite cognitive power, unlimited cognitive power, unlimited goodness, and so on, but not like unlimited spatial extent or such that he contains things. After all, he's, he's non-spatial and so on. So I think really what they're going to want to say is that that doesn't require things to be inside of God. He's omnipresent in virtue of him being able to act everywhere and cause things everywhere and know things everywhere. That's one thing that they could say. But Probably gonna have to end it there just because that would take us so far afield. Just in conclusion, thank you guys both for coming on. I quite enjoyed this. We talked about Platonism, Aristotelianism, divine conceptualism, different problems that arise for each of those, Phaser's arguments against Platonism. And then we compared at the end some, some problems for divine conceptualism and whether or not it has an explanatory advantage over Platonism and so on. Do you guys have any final words before we close this out? I just wanna congratulate, congratulate both of you for uh, pressing into these murky waters yeah. <laughs> and uh it's it sounds like uh if we keep talking about it that we'll make progress i yeah. think so thank you for doing this i appreciate it thanks for having me
once again, thank you to both uh, Scott and Joe for agreeing to uh, this discussion where I can share my ideas and get more exposure. Again, um, this was this was my first book, so I'm very glad you have given it such a thoughtful and sympathetic attention. Just for the audience, uh, you guys know that I am a college student, so uh, you know I live on like breadcrumbs and pigeon poop and so on. So it, if you guys feel so inclined, if you see, if you see value in the work that I do, uh, if you see value in you know bringing scholars on and talking about all these stuff about the fundamental nature of reality, consider supporting me on Patreon. Much love to all my existing patrons. You get lots of cool goodies, like exclusive access, early access to things. If you feel so inclined, please support me on Patreon or through a one-time donation. Think of it like a tip at the end of like a, a violinist performance. You know, you could just put in $2 or something like that. But what better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is The Majesty of Reason and peace out. Peace out.